All right, thank you. Um, I'm a, a, an orthopedic surgeon at Cornell. I've been there since 2004. Wow. Um, and I went to school at Texas A&M, graduated in 99, then did my internship at Purdue, went back to A&M for my surgery residency, and then spent a year at the University of Florida and have been up here ever since. I followed a boy to come to the cold Northwest, and now that boy is my husband. Um, most days I don't regret that. Um, so anyway, so what I was asked to talk about is orthopedic care and surgery in the shelter. Um, and it's one of those, oh, that's right, this doesn't work. Um, it's one of those things that I've done a lot of volunteer work for shelters, especially when I was a resident in Texas, um, and then when the shelter, when our local shelter's here and the rescues bring us cases, I work with them as well. However, I don't work in a shelter every single day, so I'm not very knowledgeable about the things that you would like me to talk about. Um, the things that I sort of included in this lecture is an orthopedic exam, what needs to be done, so who needs surgery, who doesn't, right? Um, what can you do, and then the age-old question of what should you do? Um, and because this is actually a very, very large topic, what I've done through this is I've added in a little bit of a choose-your-own-adventure thing. Um, so there's a couple stopping points here where I'm going to ask, do you guys want to continue along this path, or would you like to skip this next part and then you know, go on to the next topic? Um, and so we'll do it by a show of hands or whatnot. So first things first, the orthopedic exam. Um, <laughs> we wish, right, that a dog looked like that with all the bones painted on the outside. Unfortunately, that's not how it is, right? It's probably the most important thing that you're going to do when an animal presents to you in any situation, whether it's in primary practice or in a shelter or in a referral practice, um, it's the most important thing you can do to figure out why the animal is lame or uncomfortable just because they can't talk. Your fingers are going to have to do the talking for them, right? Um, and especially in shelter situations, the history might be unavailable, might be inaccurate. You never know what ends up um, on, your, on your front doorstep. And so hopefully by the end of our ortho exam, we can usually tell which leg it is and usually also which joint. Um, and then from there, we can get the most likely differentials based on the signalment and where we think the dog is, is hurting, which diagnostic tests are appropriate, and then also appropriate treatment options. So by the end of your ortho exam, you should have a list of these things in your brain um, that will then point you in the right direction um, as to how to come to the answer the quickest without doing a lot of extraneous um, uh, uh, use of resources. So the ortho ex exam itself is, is divided into three sub-exams, the visual gait exam, the standing exam, and a recumbent exam. And the visual gait exam, sometimes this is all you get, especially in a shelter situation. You can't handle the dog, the dog has never been handled. Um, there, there are a lot of different reasons that you might not be able to put your hands on the actual animal. So for the visual exam, First of all, where is the animal? Is it up on any seats or any, anything elevated that it can um, uh, get on? Um, does the animal get up easily on slick floors? Does it need assistance? Does it refuse? So these are all things to, to um, take a look at. We have at Cornell beautifully slick floors, um, and you know they're nice and shiny, but the dogs with orthopedic disease don't do really well. This dog, you can see, has a hunched posture. When, they, when they're kyphotic like that, you have to worry that they have something going on in their back end because they're shifting their weight forwards, and by doing that, they hunch their back a little bit. Um, another thing that they will do when they're not very comfortable is they will hug the walls. They don't like the footing, they're not sure of themselves on sketchy footing, slippery footing, and they will hug the walls. Um, the other thing that you can also do is do um, straight lines and, and circles, right? And so just like in lunging a horse, the inside leg will potentially show a lameness. Another thing to look for that's very subtle is as you watch this little Labrador walk to the, look at its um, left hind leg. See how you can see more pad on its left hind leg? Again, this is a subtle thing that you can look for as the animal is just in its cage. Um, this Labrador actually had to be sedated in order for her to be this calm. Um, the, uh, the other thing to watch for, again, is toe spread. If they're not putting their weight all the way on that foot, their toes are not going to spread as far on the lame leg as the other leg. So these are all subtle clues that you can look for as the animal is just going around in its, in its um, uh, confined area. 
The other thing to do is to listen. This dog was referred for elbow dysplasia. Um, I don't think he's got that. Um, it turns out he has um, he had a brachial plexus tumor and needed this leg removed, right? But you can hear this guy scuffing, dragging his leg. And that's another thing, especially if you have access to concrete um, in your runs or outside or something, that's a great area to just listen for any sort of scuffing. So at the end of your visual exam, you should be able to say, is the gait abnormal, yes or no, right? Okay, fine, if it's abnormal, is it orthopedic or neurologic? What do we think this little Dalmatian is here? Whoa. Neurologic. It's totally neurologic, right? Back end looks like it's had a few too many. Front end is stone cold sober. So if you decide it's orthopedic, front or back, left or right, and then, again, your differentials based on the signalment and the gait. You can really start narrowing it down. Is it a six-year-old fat Labrador? Well, it's probably got cruciate or maybe hip dysplasia, right? Is it a six-month-old Labrador and it's in the forelimb? Maybe we should check out his elbows. Um, and then you have cases that present like this. Um, this is uh, Dr. Dan Fletcher's cat, one of our criticalists, who um, tangled with um, his Great Danes. And um, you watch, watch Jack as he turns around. He has a very classic gait. I always include this because once you see it, you will not forget it. So that's the shoulder blade up by his ear. He has a scapular avulsion. What do you do with this? This is two days after it happened. Yeah, exactly. Pain management with cat in a box. Um, I have a video of him four years later. It rides a little higher, but he jumps up and down off of furniture, no problem whatsoever. Same thing in dogs. They do really, really well with conservative management of um, scapular evulsions. All right. Um, for <laughs> the standing exam, um, so let's say now you can touch your pet, right? Um, the key points are symmetry. You might not be able to tell, oh, this dog has elbow effusion or subtle hock effusion, but if you can tell a difference between the right side and the left side, even if they have bilateral disease, it will clue you in. Bilateral disease is never 110% perfectly symmetrical, right? So you're looking for subtle differences, sometimes they're obvious, sometimes they're not so obvious, between the right side and the left side. Muscle mass, weight bearing, joint effusion is definitely something that you want to assess when they're loading their joints. Much, much, much easier. Um, once they're not loading their joints, it kind of um, uh, gets sort of sucked in and, and you don't have a good, good idea necessarily. One thing that I teach my students about, and you know, you look really cool the first time when you do this without touching the dog, say, oh, he's got long femur disease. What? Didn't learn about that in med school, right? So this is a normal back leg in a little Dalmatian. And um, what we have, um, again, we haven't touched the dog yet, is, right, we have the patella right here. Um, there's the femur, and then there's the tibial tuberosity. That's usually this, this lower point right here. And so your normal leg has one bony bump and then another bony bump, right? Um, for dogs with long femur disease, you look at the dog. This is the same Dalmatian other side, and you're like, well, this looks really long. Like, why does his femur look this long? Well, here's his tibial tuberosity. His patella is sucked back because he's in thrust. This dog has a complete cruciate tear, and they stand in thrust. Um, so, you know, I can take the little drawings off, and you can see it. However, sometimes it's really obvious. When you see a dog like this, a couple of things, right? She's shifting her weight forward. She doesn't care that she's standing on one of our technician's shoes. Um, you can see how muscle atrophied she is, and you can see how long those femurs look. This is not Photoshopped. This is because this poor dog is in permanent thrust because she's got um, significant, uh, she, she's got completely torn cruciates. Yes, ma'am. Do you even notice that like, in the acute phases right afterwards? Or is it more better? Chronic? So the question is, do we see this acutely or chronically? Um, we see them, we see it in dogs that don't have a lot of secondary fibrosis yet. So that have just recently ruptured um, uh, is, is usually the case. Um, and so then here's a video of a former resident doing a standing ortho exam on her own dog, Jesse, who is um, probably one of the best dogs in the world ever because he just stands there. And so the first thing that you do is you put their neck through a range of motion. You can palpate the lateral processes um, of their cervical vertebrae. 
Um, you can actually slide your hand under and palpate ventrally as well. And then what she's doing is um, pushing down on the spinous processes. She's just making a V with her thumb and her index finger and pushing down on the bones as she goes. She's not grabbing the apaxial muscles and, and, and pushing into that. You can do a tail hike if you want to. I personally am not a big fan, um, just because dogs will react for a variety of reasons there. If you think your dog is neurologic, definitely check their conscious proprioception. Always support the dog underneath so they don't get um, scared. And notice that she's doing this on a rug, um, not on a slippery surface, so the dog is as comfortable as, as possible. And now what she's gonna do is she's going to straddle the dog. Again, not possible in some personalities of dogs. Um, then you try to do it from the side. And now what she's doing is she's palpating for symmetry and joint diffusion. So she's palpating for joint diffusion. She just did the elbows and then she did the carpi. Um, now she's checking the caudal thigh group um, for muscle mass. Um, she's palpating for joint diffusion around the stifle, right around that patellar tendon. Um, and then she's feeling for symmetry as she comes down the tibia and um, the Achilles tendons as well, palpating for joint diffusion of the hock. And then she has the dog do a little dance to see if there are any subtle differences in where the dog is bearing weight. You have to make sure that the dog's not looking to one side or the other side, right? Because if they're looking to the right, the right side's gonna be more loaded. But she's just checking to make sure to see that there's not a certain um, leg that the dog is favoring. And that's it. That's it for a standing exam. These do not have to be long, drawn out things. If you do it same way every single time, then um, you'll get to be pretty quick and efficient at it. Um, for the recumbent exam, if you have an animal that is amenable to um, being laid down, um, this is something that my residents introduced me to. Um, you can imagine that there's variations of this. Um, but CREPI, apparently, um, stands for Crepitus Range of Motion Diffusion Pain and Instability. These are the things that you want to make sure that you evaluate every joint um, for. Um, the other thing that I frequently see as I see students learning their orthopedic exam is that they forget to isolate the joint. As they put a joint through the range of motion, they're not holding onto the two bones around the joint, but they're a couple of bones away. Well, it's really hard to isolate one joint if you actually have a couple of joints that you're manipulating at the same time. Um, the key points during a recumbent exam are checking for pain-free and full range of motion. It's usually pretty obvious if it's restricted range of motion, but there are also cases of too much range of motion. For example, a positive ortolani, right? So don't forget to check for those. Um, ligaments is instability, so checking of the collaterals you generally want to do while the joint is in extension. Um, Cruciate disease, again, don't forget to check for that. Patellar luxations, and then also shoulder instability is another thing that we frequently forget to check, um, and it's um, very common in these smaller breed dogs. So anything that you can kind of pick up with one hand and has a lot of hair, um, if they have a forelimb lameness, check their shoulders. Shih tzus and things like that tend to be prone to uh, medial shoulder instability. Okay, and so here's my first sort of choose your own adventure. Do you guys want to see videos and whatnot of a recumbent exam, or do you want to say, nah, let's just skip on to radiographs? Radiographs. radiographs. Everybody for radiographs, raise your hand. Okay, and then recumbent exam, raise your hand. Ah, uh, sorry, you guys lose. Um, but it's all in the notes that I just gave to somebody. Okay, so radiographs. So you've done your recumbent exam and your standing exam or whatnot, um, and now you have decided, okay, great, I need to radiograph whichever joint. Always, always, always take two orthogonal radiographs, right? Very, very important. Else you can have situations, for example, like this. Well, okay, here's a dog who comes in with a forelimb lameness. It's a puppy. Um, and you see this, and you're like, well, is this normal? Is this not normal? I mean, there's a growth plate right here. Do I need to be worried about this or not? Well, maybe yes, right? When you take the orthogonal view, you can tell that he actually slipped um, his proximal humeral physis. And this um, requires surgical intervention. Um, radiograph the other side if you're not sure. If you don't have a radiologist that is, you know, down the hall or at the end of the line or can review your radiographs quickly, most dogs aren't bilaterally, symmetrically, abnormal, perfectly. Um, so, you know, if you think the dog might have a physial injury, you radiograph the other side to see what that more normal physis potentially looks like. And again, nowadays in the, you know, age of teleradiology, 
You can always email your radiographs to either radiologists. We get, um, I know the, us, us three orthopods at Cornell, we get emails almost daily from people saying, hey, can you just give me a quick opinion? And we're more than happy to do that. Um, here's another one. Here's a dog that came in with a stifle lameness. And again, the radiograph on the, cranio, um, the craniocaudal view doesn't look all that exciting. Then you take a lateral and you're like, well, they do have this weird growth plate here and there's the tubal tuberosity. Maybe he just hasn't consolidated yet. Well, let's just take a picture of the other side. Well, whoops, right, abnormal. So he has a tubal tuberosity avulsion. Is that surgical? How do you tell if it's surgical? So here's what I do. I take a picture with them in a standing angle and then a lateral, a, lateral, um, a radiograph with them um, in a standing angle lateral and then I maximally flex it. If this thing doesn't move between the two radiographs, you're okay just to put a splint on the dog and they will be just fine. Does not necessarily need surgical intervention. If it moves, different story, yes it needs pins. Um, and that kind of brings us into, well, what actually needs to be done? And especially in shelter and rescue situations, sometimes that question is not very easy to answer, right? So the thing that we always deal with is to cut or not to cut, uh, which is why I have Shakespeare on the previous slide. So to cut, some fractures are obviously surgical, some fractures are not. Hip luxations in dogs with hip dysplasia. If the dog has hip dysplasia and luxated its hip, you can try to put it back in, it will not stay, and the dog will still remain with a chronically painful joint. So again, those guys, surgical intervention is indicated. Joint luxations that can't be reduced or don't stay reduced. So if you put an elbow back in, but it pops right back out, if you put a hip back in, whichever, and they pop right back out, again, those guys then need surgical intervention. And then if you are in a shelter situation and you are doing an ortho exam on something that is, um, uh, you know, a puppy that's prone to hip dysplasia and you find um, a positive ortolani, then a juvenile pubic symphysiodesis might actually be indicated as a preventative measure for hip dysplasia. Um, and so I know that that's not a very commonly talked about topic. Um, so I have it here, we can talk about JPS here as a quick aside, because it's something that anybody with a cautery unit that can spay a dog can do. Or we can say, you know what, let's just move on to what is not surgical. Okay, everybody for JPS, raise your hands. Oh, okay, that wins. All right, so, so in JPS, the juvenile pubic symphysiodesis is essentially fusing the pubic symphysis. And you know, there's lots of fancy ways to explain it, but if you imagine, this is your pelvis, right? Your, pubis, your pubic symphysis is between my thumb, thumbs, and here's your um, acetabular, they're my fingers. Generally speaking, when a pelvis grows, they grow up and out like this, right? You fuse the pubis, they're gonna grow down and increase your femoral head coverage. So what happens is that this is essentially dynamic triple pelvic osteotomy without the side effects. The problem is you have to do this um, while they are young enough to do it and they still have growth left. So generally speaking, between 20 to, uh, sorry, between 12 to 20 um, weeks of age. Um, how do you select a patient? There are interesting ways of looking at distraction indices, but again, realistically speaking, very few people are gonna do pen hip distraction indices in their shelter. And so the ways I've decided to cut my own dogs um, is palpable laxity. So a dog has positive ortolani, and people will argue a dog should never, ever, ever have a positive ortolani. Sure, if you're big and strong, you can overpower anything, but you probably would recognize that. Um, and they have to be between 12 and 20 weeks of age, which is why shelter situations are actually potentially very good situations to intervene in these guys because you see them early and you generally speaking, spay or neuter them very early. You can get about a 10 to 15 degree improvement in the coverage of the, of the femoral head um, if you um, uh, cut them fairly early. And it's really, really easy, your standard sort of aseptic um, approach that you would use in draping whatnot that you, you would use for a spay. Um, and you just take your ventral midline incision over probably the, the cranial half or so of the pubis. Um, you also want to make sure if this is a male that you enter into the abdomen um, uh, just cranial to the pubis so you can push the urethra out of the way. Same thing 
for females, right? Because if you take a cotter unit and blindly stick it through the, um, through the uh, pubic symphysis, what sits on the other side is the, the dog's urethra. So it's just a little, for a spay, you're already there. You just stick your finger under the pubic symphysis, easy cheesy lemon squeezy, and you just cauterize down onto your finger, essentially. Um, there are papers out there telling you exactly what to set your cotter unit to. Um, and the, I mean, there's the, the, uh, the approach, like I said, is, is fairly, fairly easy. So your midline approach, and then you just elevate your ductor and gracilis off the pubic symphysis. Um, and you've done your linea alba approach, and then you, what we have here is, so this is caudal, this is cranial. You can see right here, this is the little approach um, into the abdomen. This is a male. Um, and then um, here's just some retractors holding it back, and that's the, that's the pubic symphysis. Um, in the next slide, um, all you need is a, is a standard cautery unit. This is right here is what is recommended for the cranial third to half of the symphysis. The 10 to 30 seconds, that's kind of a large range. I essentially do it until it's black and bubbly. Um, and then you go every two to three millimeters or so. So what I actually do is I go about every six millimeters, and then I come back and do the intermediate spaces. Um, and what we've done here, this is the same dog again, the cranials up here, caudals down here. Instead of having a finger under the pubis because it made the picture just more confusing because there were too many fingers in here, um, just for the picture, we used a scalpel handle so you can see where you need to put your finger. Don't actually put a scalpel handle under, under there because that will conduct the electricity you know, through to the surrounding structures. So don't, don't do what the picture shows. Um, and it takes probably about three minutes or so to do the whole thing. I would recommend everybody try cadaver first. Um, and then you just close it, sub Q, skin, and that's it. There is no special follow-up care other than the normal care that you would use for a post spay or neuter animal. Um, so that's really, really nice. Um, the issue becomes less so in um, uh, shelter care because you guys, generally speaking, will spay or neuter the animal at that same point in time. There's a bit of an ethical issue in primary care where owners don't want their animal neutered that early, but you're changing the phenotype of this dog, right? So their hips are going to look better, but you're not changing the genotype. And so if for whatever reason the animal is not spayed or neutered at the same time, there is a lot of ethical concern about it. And what some surgeons that I've talked to have said is, well, we leave behind a surgical marker, surgical clip, something, so that if the, dog tr the owner tries to get the dog OFA'd, the radiologist reading says that dog has had surgical intervention because there's a surgical implant. And that will hopefully kick off some questions. Um, they have um, looked at uh, what happens two years down the road after GPS, and the OA is dramatically decreased as long as it's done by 20 weeks of age. Um, and uh, that's, uh, that, again, is really important. Um, I've actually already just talked about this. Um, the little brown and white fuzzy dog is my own that had a JPS um, at about 12 weeks of age. Um, and my decision on her was, you have a positive Bortolani, and I'm an orthopedic surgeon. So you're going to have a JPS. And she hasn't, she hasn't looked back since. Um, so we've kind of done the two cut. The not to cut, again, some fractures are not surgical. Don't be afraid to appropriately conservatively manage a fracture. Most developmental orthopedic diseases in a shelter situation are not surgical. Hip dysplasias, elbow dysplasias, those are probably referral type um, of situations or chronic pain management if it's an adult animal. And then most joint luxations um, are not surgical. Um, they are, generally speaking, something that you can do closed reductions on. If you can do the closed reduction and you can keep it in, then the animal will do just fine with conservative management. Except, of course, like we talked about a minute, if the dog is hip dysplasia. So when it comes to fractures, this is always one of those things where there's a lot of, um, you know, learning and growing as you go through the years. Um, and it's a very common question that the students on ortho always ask about is, well, who do you send to surgery and who don't you send to surgery? And so I've tried to sort of put down a few rules um, or suggestions, I guess, um, for management of fractures. So surgical management of fractures, if they're articular, joint fractures, those are surgical until proven otherwise. 
because you can't have secondary bone healing. You can't have any type of callus formation because that will then result in um, permanent OA for that dog. So those guys, generally speaking, are considered surgical. Um, if they're displaced greater than 50%, mode can actually have a little bit of trouble remembering that it's supposed to heal across. So if they're markedly malaligned um, or displaced, um, uh, then those guys should probably be surgical. Malaligned, well, yeah, the bone's talking to each other, but the leg's on at 90 degrees, well, maybe that's not the best thing for the dog, right? Um, so malalignment also is something that we have to try to prevent. Um, if you are unable to maintain reduction because of fracture configuration, so let's say the animal has a radius ulna fracture, a transverse fracture that you can get reduce and reduced and 50% overlap will do fine in a cast. However, if it's an oblique fracture, those guys you can try to get reduced, but because they're oblique, the bone ends are just going to slide right past each other. So you actually can't get those guys and maintain those guys in, um, in, uh, in, in reduction. Um, and then, of course, temperament. There are some dogs that you just, you just can't touch repeatedly for cast changes or sedate repeatedly for cast changes or whatnot. And so again, those guys, um, surgery, surgical intervention might be the cheaper, easier, and much better for the patient option. Um, and avulsion fractures. Why avulsion fractures? Because something's pulling on it to cause an avulsion fracture. So, you know, triceps or calcaneal avulsions, things like that, those are surgical because they won't heal because usually the label's piece is a couple of counties over. Um, Non-surgical ones are green stake or fissure fractures. So if the fissure does not go out the second cortex, you see fissure in one cortex but not in any of the other cortices, then you're usually good to go. They're generally speaking non-displaced. If the ulna or the fibula is still intact, and it took me a long time to get my brain wrapped around this, so two bone systems, like the antebrachium and the tibia, right? They all have that little extra strut of bone, the ulna and the, and the fibula. If you have a low velocity injury, those guys sometimes stay intact and they keep everything aligned and at length. So those guys are really beautifully managed just in a cast. Pelvic fractures in the non-weight bearing arch, again, put the dog or the cat in a box, they generally speaking do fine. The other thing is, though, that you have to keep in mind, the realism of the situation. If you have like an ileal, a mildly displaced ileal body fracture on one side, the animal is normal <laughs> on the other side and has no neurologic deficits, then again, even though if it's in the weight-bearing arch, it's okay for you guys to manage it in a box. I do. Um, it saves the owner a lot of money, and if the animal can ambulate, then um, generally speaking, they, they can do fairly well. Stable, mildly displaced um, SI luxations without neuro deficits. And without neuro deficits is really important. If they have neuro deficits, then yes, we should pull this thing back in place and, and keep, try to keep it there. Um, but if they're stable, so when the dog is heavily sedated or anesthetized, you cannot take that ileal wing and move it up to their ears and you know out the back and stuff like that. Um, if they're fairly stable, then those guys again do really well with dog in a box. Um, and no scapular fractures. They have a lot of surrounding muscle mass, unless it's a markedly displaced um, scapular neck fracture, um, or obviously a glenoid fracture where it's articular. Those guys, if it's scapular body, scapular spine, generally speaking, are managed um, conservatively. So I brought a few cases. Um, this is a Sheltie, a young Sheltie that got stepped on uh, by its owner on the way to a potty break. Um, and the owner brought him in the next morning. Does everybody see the problem? It doesn't project real well, but you can see right here, this, this animal has a green stick fracture. So do we cut it or do we not cut it? No. Oh, we didn't even put him in a splint. We said, keep your dog in a box. Okay, here's another one. So this is a dog that I actually forgot what type of trauma this dog had, um, but we took a craniocaudal of the cyclair because it was swollen and painful. Um, and this doesn't look all that exciting. If you kind of look through here, you're like, well, that, that's probably just projection. He probably just has a very dishy um, uh, proximal tibia. But then you take the other view, because that's what we do, and we say, whoops, that's not right. Um, so he doesn't really have a tibial terrestre avulsion. He has a proximal tibial fracture, in, and this is the only one like this that I've ever seen in this configuration. So um, do we cut it or do we not cut it? Can you take views and two different extensions? That's 
a really good point. Can we take flex and extended views? Absolutely. Should have done that. Didn't do it. Um, but yes, if it doesn't move, then maybe we can feel comfortable not doing anything. I would probably do surgery. That's sort of where I was headed. And then Rory Todd Hunter, who's done this in about 8,000 years more than I have, he's like, oh, our slope. No, no, no. <laughs> Fine, Rory. Um, but the other thing also was that um, there were financial concerns here. And because this fracture line here does not go into the joint, we were actually fine managing it conservatively. However, what is the function of the bandage that you're going to put on this dog? What movement do you want to prevent? Flexion, right. You want to prevent stifle flexion. So you're going to build a fairly big bandage or a bandage with a splint in it that prevents stifle flexion. Uh, 30 days later, he looked like this. He's consolidating nicely. You can't even see this fracture line anymore. He's consolidated it here. Um, and then we, we never saw him again. He was sound at this point. So use your common sense. Don't be scared. If all else fails, ask, you know, phone a friend with more experience than you have. Um, here's another one. We just saw this dog last month, June 11th. This is a little English bulldog that came in. Um, that was <laughs> stepped on by the sister-in-law while carrying a pink alcoholic beverage. <laughs> so the dog came in pink and broken. Um, and apparently there was a party, there was, it, was, it was a fun situation for the intern that received the dog. So do we cut this or do we not cut this? How old is it? Uh, five months. Exactly, fibula's intact, there's very little displacement of segments. Here's the fibula wee, going all the way down, fibula going all the way down. So you can see it's at length and minimally displaced. So here we are, July 19th, healed like gangbusters. And actually, by the time we got the rats, the dog had already been walking around for two weeks without a, a splint on because he, um, he'd had some cast issues. So we took it off and the owners were very financially restricted, needed to save a couple of weeks to get money for radiographs. Um, but here we go and, and the dog is now running around like a normal little bulldog that should. Uh, here's another one, scapular fracture. Yay or nay, cut it or not? Yep, right, just what we talked about. We're just gonna leave that be and this dog will be just fine. <coughs> All right, here's another one. This belongs to a former student. Um, this is a little cat named Moxie uh, who liked to crawl up on the fridge and may have fallen down off said fridge. Cut or not cut? So this is what attaches. So, okay, do we know, do you guys all know where this piece of bone belongs? Yeah, right here, right? It's the leg or not. Who attaches onto it? Triceps, yeah. So just there, again, you know, it's a couple of counties over. Um, we definitely need to, to cut it. And here's um, a little intra-op shot um, of, again, it's not a very difficult repair, a couple of pins um, and, a, and the circlage, and the, I'm sorry, figure of eight wire. And then eventually these were pulled and, and Moxie did just fine. When we talk about fractures and conservative fracture management, it is really important that we talk about appropriate bandaging and casting for these guys. Um, for dogs and cats, if you do not include their foot in a bandage, right, it swells up hugely. So everything that we're gonna talk about is going to include the foot in the bandage as well. It doesn't really matter if it's got an elbow fracture or a carpal fracture, the foot, you're always gonna bandage from the toes on up. Um, these are the recommendations. If your fracture is in the black parts, your bandage has to go to a joint above and a joint below, include that. So your, the bandage for, for example, met metacarpal fractures is gonna go up to the elbow. Um, for antibrachial fractures, you have to include the elbow and then essentially the same thing in the rear leg. Um, if you are conservatively managing a fracture, a full bivalve cast is the way to go. You will, some, somebody, always, so somebody asked me, well, how do you know that your cast is not too stable? Well, that's biomechanically impossible to do. You cannot make a cast that's more stable than the amount of force that the animal can put on it to the point where it will protect the leg from healing. So that just can't happen. Um, you always have to include the joint above and below, and eventually, yes, you will have bandage complications. And because you will have bandage complications, you need to warn the owners or the adopters or the foster parents or whoever 
that conservative management is not necessarily a way to save money. Um, especially if you have to include a bony prominence, right? This is always appropriate. You will never build something that is too strong for whatever this dog has. More likely that you will build something that's not strong enough and the fracture will move. Splinting I usually use as a step down from a full cast. So if an animal has a radius ulnar fracture and I've cast all the way above the, uh, the elbow and after about a month or so they develop a, a pressure sore on their electronon, then I will take them down into a caudal splint. I'll usually use caudal splints in the front limb and then lateral splints in the rear limb. Um, you still have to include the joint above and below because the point is to immobilize the entire bone. And the only way to do that is to include um, uh, the joint above and, and joint below. Um, just a quick little review of bandaging. Um, this is a, a greyhound that actually had a wound um, and an old fracture that we were dealing with. So that's the primary contact layer. Um, what we have is the toes are down here. Here's the elbow. Um, and so we're wrapping from the toes on up. Again, your cast padding, 50% overlap. You can't really pull good cast padding too tight. It'll break first. Um, then you put your cling on. Uh, the cling, you can pull too tight, so you have to be very careful um, with this. And then you can incorporate your splint with your cling as you're coming back down. Um, and again, this was a healing fracture so um, and a, a greyhound, um, so we really needed to preserve that olecranon, so we're going below that um, with this dog. And then here you have your nice hot pink um, uh, uh, splint for her, and you can see just the two little uh, middle toenails coming out. And, uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, why are we leaving the toenails out? So no, you don't actually have to. You want to be, be able to, when you look in the bottom of the cast or bandage or whatever, you want to be able to see the two middle toenails or pads or so. This is a greyhound. They have long toenails. They happen to come out. But you don't actually have to see them. Um, a reason that we try to leave uh, an opening at the bottom versus covering everything up is so A, you can tell if it's getting wet by sticking your finger in there, and B, more importantly, you can tell if they're swelling because then the toenails will part. And if, if you have parting toenails that haven't been, then we need to change the bandage. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, so what would you do in a situation where they're in a shelter and there's a high risk of the bandage getting wet when they leave? So that's, <laughs> that's a really good question. The question is what would we do, what should we do if in a shelter situation during daily cleaning, the bandage is likely to get wet. You can do one of, well, you can do several things. You can change the bandage while they're cleaning the cage and that way, you know, maybe it won't get wet or move the animal out. If that is not a possibility, you can put um, uh, IV bags over the bottom. You don't want to leave those on because the moisture, the natural moisture from the dog is going to sit there and fester, right? And then you're going to have these nasty infected feet um, you can temporarily, temporarily put um, uh, diapers up over them, um, and there are in, so in kids, they have swim casts. Uh, my kid had a cast, cast last year, and they put this stuff, instead of cast padding, um, they used um, something that is actually made to get wet. And the company, if you call the company, if you just Google swim cast, you can find it. They will actually send you samples, and it's something to consider in some situations. I put it on a deer, it did well with the deer, except for the fact that it was a rapidly growing deer and the rehabber didn't bring it back, and then it developed pressure sores. But the skin looked great um, after three weeks in, in a cast um, with this swim cast stuff. So there are other things that are slowly coming into the veterinary side that are potential considerations, um, but the best thing is to ideally move the animal. That way you don't have to change the bandage every day and um, uh, or maybe I'll keep them elevated but it's that gets really hard we struggle with the same thing owners walk their dogs in dewy grass or in the snow or whatever else or they pee on it and, you know then you have to change it unfortunately um, another question that I sometimes get is when, when when do you amputate like when do you just say that's it you know we're done um, when is that okay to do and sometimes it's really obvious this dog here um, was shot a month prior to presenting to us um, you can see his humeral fracture and for a month he was um, 
mismanaged. Um, this is his German Shepherd. Um, this is his humerus right there. Um, we can see a few more pictures. Um, didn't smell real great either. Um, and so when something like this comes in, it's pretty obvious, right? You know, there's nothing anybody's going to do for this leg to save it. And this animal attached to the leg was septic and, you know, was really, really trying really hard to stay alive. So yeah, we took it off. And that's what the inside of that thing looked like. Um, and he bounced back gangbusters. He was like, I didn't want that leg. Three days later, he was out of the hospital. So um, uh, sometimes it's really, really obvious, but sometimes it's not that obvious. You know, this is a, um, a rabbit that was outside while um, the owners were mowing. And well, the leg was mowed off. Well, you know, you can't leave little bones sticking out. So again, it's sort of obvious. But the thing that you have to keep in mind, and the thing that I try to you know, remember myself, is that if, you, if there's no way that realistically speaking you can provide permanent pain relief for this animal and quality of life, then an amputation is just fine. A couple of weeks ago, we amputated a humeral fracture in a cat that we could have easily fixed. The owners did not have the money, so the leg came off. The cat is fine on three legs. So again, I think we just have to be very realistic and remember, that animals on three legs can be just fine. Um, I know a couple of cats on two legs that they just have, they have congenital um, uh, absence of their rear limbs or malformations that were then removed and they just walk around on their front legs. Um, and that's just fine too, completely fine. Those cats will learn. Um, this cat could go up and down stairs and jump up and down um, off the, jumping up was hard, but she would, she was very comfortable jumping down off of things. So just, um, Keep in mind that they're much more athletic um, than we give them credit for. Another question is, well, what, what, what can I do? Well, that's a really difficult question, right? Um, because that is a question about each of our skill sets. What do we feel comfortable doing, right? And it's the experience that we've had and the people that we've um, worked with. But there are absolutely ways of increasing your experience. Um, you can take courses. One thing that for fracture fixation, external fixation is actually really, I hate to say easy. However, I will quote my senior students when we did an ortho distribution last year and they all put an X fix on a plastic bone. They said, several of them said, I came in thinking this was gonna be so confusing, but this is actually really easy. And yeah, it actually sort of is. And the IMIX course, for example, is really good if your shelter is a situation where you can go and take this course and they would potentially support you in learning this and using it on some patients. Um, the inventory is not very expensive. There are also lots and lots of cruciate repair um, technique labs out there. We're doing another one at um, the New York State Vet Conference. Um, but it's, uh, you know, expand your skills if you're interested. This is an example of something that could easily be handled. This is an open fracture in a cat, right? We put a type two X fix on. This was him six weeks later, um, again, it does not take a lot of advanced training to learn how to do this if you have a situation where you're supported in this. And again, remember you can always phone a friend. We are at the end of a phone line, it doesn't matter where you are, there's a surgeon somewhere in calling range that is happy to take your call and say, oh yeah, you could do this, you could do that, you know, A, B, or C. So don't hesitate to reach out to people that have um, a, um, different experiences than you do. And the other thing that somebody taught me a long time ago was um, when I was like, oh, I can do X, A, B, and C, and they were like, but are you comfortable with the complications of A, B, and C? And that made me stop and think, because that's actually a really, really good question. You shouldn't do something that you're not comfortable handling the complications of. So if it's implant failure, if it's infection, you need to know what you want to do and how to do it appropriately for that animal. And some of that would come with experience, right? So you can't be comfortable with every complication, but you do have to have some sort of a, a you know, comfort with yourself to, be, to say, hey, there's a complication, here's how we're going to deal with it. And there's nothing wrong with referring it elsewhere, obviously, but just be aware if you do any sort of surgical intervention, there will be complications <coughs> secondary to that. And there's also the reality of working in a shelter situation, right? There are pressures um, to place the animal. There are unknowns about the follow-up care. And so again, 
These are all things that you want to keep in mind as you decide sort of what can I do. But this also plays into kind of the next question, which is, well, what should I do? Because what I can do might not be what I should be doing, right? Um, the questions that I always ask myself, or some of the questions that I ask myself is, well, do I have the facilities to do what I you know, can do or am comfortable doing? And are there any factors suggesting that now is not a good time to do this? Any illness, any skin issues in the animal, anything along those lines. Ideally, right, you want a dedicated operating room, anesthetic support, a surgical assistant, or somebody that um, you know, helps you, you want to be able to see what you're doing. These are all sort of basics, and there's going to be varying degrees of this available in various shelter situations. So again, this is one of those things where you have to ask yourself honestly, should I do an FHO in a fat dog? I don't really have the lights to shine in the deep, dark hole. So again, these are things that you have to um, consider. The, the patient itself is super duper important, right? Do you have you know, just an older dog that's systemically healthy? Do you have this? <laughs> or do you have my upside down dog, um, which is a happy two-year-old mutt, right? So again, look at the patient and see if it's in their best interest or if there's something there that needs to be managed first. Um, we know time is money, but time is also surgical infection. So again, um, if the animal's not healthy and if it's your first time doing the procedure, maybe it would be good to have somebody there with you that will um, uh, teach you um, and keep the surgical time as, as low as possible, potentially. Antibiotics for orthopedic surgery? Yes, please. Even if you're not putting an implant in, ideally you want to have something on board within 60 minutes before the incision and then we give cefazolin at 22 mg per kg every 90 minutes. Um, but then you want to discontinue it unless there's an active infection somewhere within 24 hours. Else you're actually increasing your infection rate. Um, and then you want to drape appropriately. I understand that this is, this is how Cornell drapes for space. <laughs> I thought I'd put that in there for you guys. So I understand this is not the typical spay drape. However, if you're doing orthopedic surgery, I don't want anybody seeing any part of their dog because joints, are very immunoprivileged environments and do not like getting infected. So you wanna make sure that the rest of the dog is, just imagine instead of a belly there, a leg coming out of that. Um, surgeon prep, very important, so that when your resident stabs you with a three and a half millimeter pin, you're not bleeding your own bugs into the dog. This happened two weeks ago. I'm still harassing him. Scrubs are really just a barrier. Um, and washing them, laundering standardly actually doesn't do much at all for, from a nosocomial point of view. Um, ideally, we want to tuck our tops into the pants, no undershirt showing, and then the best recommendation actually is to tuck the pants into the socks or have cuffed um, pants because where do we shed the most from? Our perineal areas. Um, does anybody do that? No, we look like this, right? Mostly. Um, boys are grosser than girls from a bug shedding point of view, just for the record. Um, and if this isn't quite your style, I found this YouTube channel. What? <laughs> Matching an undershirt with scrubs. <laughs> Clothing advice for doctor or male nurse. I didn't watch it. I showed it to my husband. He's like, for real? <laughs> so anyway, you're not supposed to wear anything under your scrubs. So moral of the story. And then scrubbing, the best thing to use are these really short acting scrubs rubs, whatever. Um, Avagard, we love Avagard because it takes minutes and you're ready to go and it has great residual activity. And you're not traumatizing your skin with those scrub brushes. Very, very important to make that shift. This is now the standard recommendation in human medicine as well, is to use non-abrasive alcohol-based type of scrubs. If I see anybody doing this shit, Rehab, these are all really, really important, right? 
Pain control, hugely important. You want to not let your dog play with porcupines. Um, treat pain early and aggressively. Um, our anesthesia department will give injectable doses of an NSAID if they did well during anesthesia before they even wake up so it's on board and starting to work, right? It's really, really important to prevent that wind up. Um, so treat these guys early, treat them aggressively, and use a combination of different drugs. NSAIDs, um, if the animal is able to receive those, so healthy liver, kidneys, you know, no bad blood pressure during surgery or whatnot, and an opioid. Gabapentin, tramadol, amantadine, there's a lot of different drugs out there that you can use. Buprenorphine in cats makes some very happy high cats. Um, generally speaking, we ice our surgical sites immediately after surgery, so they're still anesthetized and they have 10 minutes of ice popped on there. Um, and then we put our bandage on. Um, and then they're iced again once the bandage comes back off. If for whatever reason we can't bandage because it's an elbow fracture or whatnot, then um, we just ice in Q4 to six as, as we're able. And again, that helps with pain control. Sort of along those lines, just as a quick aside, because I'm sure you deal with a lot of older patients that have chronic OA, um, NSAIDs, always do blood work first on those guys. And then um, the companies all recommend every six months at minimum after that. I do like to check at two weeks, make sure there's nothing sort of brewing. Um, and then I'll go to um, about every six months or so. Chondroprotectins, Dasequin, Cosequin, whatever floats your boat, Um Fish oils. The problem with fish oils is that it's really difficult to get the right amount into your dog. They actually, the stuff that we get for us at the pharmacy, at the you know, Rite Aid or at Wegmans or whatever, um, when I talked to Joe Wachlog, he's like, that's not nearly enough for a human, much less, a, not even for a dog. And so they're, what they recommend, for example, is some stuff called grizzly salmon oil. It comes in these big pump bottles, and that has a higher concentration. And, you know, a 60-pound dog gets two pumps, you know, once or twice a day or whatever it is in their, in their food. Um, and it's pretty tasty. Appropriate exercise. Um, and in a shelter situation, again, this can be difficult if they're confined, potentially on slippery floors. The ones potentially to foster out would be the ones that have mobility issues because the more, you know, use it or lose it sort of a scenario, they've got to move to keep the muscle mass up so they don't put inappropriate loads on their joints. And then weight loss. Again, some of these guys are just chubby because whatever, either they're not exercising or they've got big brown eyes and my husband feeds the french fries from the table. Um, but it's really, really important in dogs that have chronic OA or are going to have chronic OA to keep them slim. So this is also an important bit of information for any adopters, right? Hey, your dog has you know, may have hip dysplasia, thank you, Minnie, um, may have hip dysplasia, please keep your dog skinny. You want to be able to always feel all the ribs. Actually, see the last few ribs in a short-haired dog. These are very important things to um, uh, tell owners. Incision care, no-brainer, e-collars, right? You guys are all e-collar experts. Um, uh, sometimes owners are not, though. They take it off. Soft padded bandages really nice to keep dogs away from their incisions. Sometimes you need to combine that and an e-collar. Um, there are different ways of putting light bandages on dogs. This is one of the more inventive ones um, that I've come across and I've actually tried it for a research project and it, you know, they stay off the dog. They're not, depending on the type of stocking, they're not very form-fitting, but it's a way potentially of keeping dogs away from like a leak granuloma or something maybe. Um, and then there are tegaderms, which are self-adhesive. Um, Offsites are self-adhesive, hypofix are self-adhesive, and these paw flex are also really cool. Again, you can call the company and they will send you a box of just to try. Um, and they actually Velcro around whichever area you need to protect. Um, and they can re-Velcro if you need to check on something underneath. So this is for like superficial things where, you know, it's not oozing, it's clean and dry. Again, like you're trying to prevent a dog from worsening a lick or any loma or something along those lines. So these, these have come in handy as well and we've sent these as home with owners um, uh, to use on their dogs. So in summary, high quality care can absolutely be provided in the shelter. Do a thorough exam, especially in traumatized animals um, to make sure you're not missing something. Do appropriate intervention as you can and as is available um, in wherever it is that you are, and then also provide appropriate continuity of care. Um, once the animal is fostered or placed in a, in a new home, just make sure that, that everybody is on the same page. 
Um, so expand your skill set would be one piece of it, advice, like my kid here is trying to be like mom. Um, my husband's an ophthalmologist, can you tell? <laughs> um, so expand your skill set. And then the orthopedics is a little bit like bathing a baby, right? So you have to be clean, you have to be fast, you have to be exact, you have to keep the thing warm, right? And if all else fails, use drugs. Um, <laughs> for whomever. Um, so with that, I'll take any questions. No questions? And I'm on time. That never happens. Thanks, guys.